appreciate you guys uh, filtering back in. I know it's not easy after break. <laughs> so, um, as Jim mentioned, he gave you my name, and I am the executive director for the Panhandle Regional Economic Development Coalition. I also do community development for the city of Diamond, and uh, came to the Panhandle quite a while ago <laughs> so on a rodeo scholarship to Panhandle State University there in Goodwill. So. Um, I won't tell you how long ago that was, but it, it was a little while. So I really did fall in love with the uh, people there, and, and believe it or not, I really did fall in love with the landscape there. Coming from Colorado Springs, people have a little bit of a hard time believing that, but uh, um, there's something to be said about the wide open rolling spaces that we have. And, and when it is raining, um, thank God we had a little bit of that this summer. Uh, it, it sure is nice to see those prairie grasses and the wheat and corn and everything flourishing. So um, I wanted to introduce a little more in depth uh, my panel members who were also instrumental oh, thank you. Uh, in our process as part of the stakeholders. The, the regional planning really came about when um, the City of Guyman, Fred C, the Oklahoma Panhandle Agriculture and Irrigators Association, all of us realized that we really didn't know enough about the water um, in Ogallala to know how much was left, are we using it to the best efficiency that we can, and what do we need to be doing different to make sure that uh, those conservation efforts are, are you know, being implemented and are effective. So, we all really worked together, um, collaborated with one another. It, uh, the, the regional plan was put together and we had 12 meetings, I think about 12 meetings across the uh, three. We started putting the plan together and we had these 12 meetings. But probably the key factors here is it was a collaborative effort from not just municipalities, industries, farmers, ranchers, the conservation board members, um, districts. We also brought in our surrounding states to meet with us as well to see, because the Ogallala is our main source of water, uh, we wanted to look at what Texas and Kansas were also doing and wanted them to be at the table. Um, J.D. Strong with the OWRD was also uh, instrumental in coming up to some of our meetings. And so it was a real, it was a real wide effort uh, from across the whole region. But we hired uh, Dwayne Smith from Smith & Associates, and Dwayne actually began his 32-year 32, 32 career with the Oklahoma Water Resource Board in 1978 and served his last 10 years as the executive director before retiring in 2010. In 2010, he worked for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Afghanistan on water, power, and transportation infrastructure. In 2011, Dwayne formed Smith & Associates, where he specializes in water planning, and worked with us, uh, I believe may have been one of his first projects to the Panhandle Regional Water Plan. And then he's been working with the Southwest Oklahoma Water Action Plan, and also uh, ongoing efforts for regional planning with the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations and is also now also working with us uh, in Northwest Oklahoma. I'm the Vice President of NOAA, the Northwest Oklahoma Alliance. Um, so all of, all of the economic developers from Northwest Oklahoma and leaders across that group felt it was important that we continue the efforts uh, that we put together in the Panhandle. By the way, I just want to reiterate that the Panhandle plan was not mandated by the state. This wasn't funded by the state or anybody else. This was funded by our farmers, our ranchers, our businesses, our, and our municipalities. And I think that's a really key point I'd like to make here. Uh, these are people that know that our water resource, uh, especially our farmers, you know, uh, when we talk about Russell, this is, he's a fourth generation farmer. They want to be able to pass this on to future generations. So. There's nobody out there that realizes the importance of water more than a farmer does. Um, so we, uh, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of brief you on Russell. His family, like I said, is a fourth generation Oklahoma Panhandle farmer out of Turpin, Oklahoma, in a panhandle there right on the western edge of uh, Beaver County, eastern uh, Texas County. 
They, his father had began irrigating in 1976, and they currently have about 50% of uh, their acreage being uh, under irrigation. They might mainly raise corn, milo, soybeans, sunflowers, and wheat. And Russell is the president of the Oklahoma Panhandle and Agricultural uh, Irrigators uh, Association Board. He also serves as the treasurer of the Equity Exchange. So uh, with that, I want to go on in. Um, like I said, we had meetings across the region. We did have over 900 participants in those meetings. And for those of you that have been to the Panhandle, um, I think total, <laughs> not quite, but <laughs> um, we, you know, the, the entire three counties of the Panhandle probably have less than 30,000 uh, population. So uh, it was a pretty good turnout, and that was a wide range of people that got involved and, and realized the importance of really digging down deep to figure out what we have under our feet. So. Uh, you know, really wanted to make sure that we had our future secured and, and that we were utilizing the best practices uh, of, for that. You can read our mission statement here uh, due to time constraints. I'm not going to go over every detail of that, but really it's about utilizing, getting the best economic impact by using water the most efficiently that we can. And just kind of reiterate that with the uh, buckets and really kind of focusing on the governor and the water board's water for 2060 goal. Uh, one thing that was really exciting we found in our plan, and Wayne will kind of go over those technical details in a minute, but the one great thing that we really found out was that we're already using 60% less water today than we were 40 years ago. And a lot of that is due to our farmers investing millions of dollars of their own money into irrigation and other uh, conservation efforts. Municipality, um, there's been a lot of different things, but to uh, just kind of go over the few main ones. Prensi, along with the city of Guymon, was really instrumental in 2011 in pushing a bill uh, that was authored by uh, Scott Martin. And we have a few legislators in the room here as well, uh, Senator Schultz and uh, Representative McBride that both really helped us push those efforts through to, to have uh, water reuse implemented in Oklahoma. So we're, we're proud to kind of take part ownership of that as well. So I guess we're kind of reusing water in a sense already. Um, but we are in the process of doing a, an official water reuse study and hope to use several million gallons a day to be rerouted, uh, to put in our Sunset Lake and then apply to our golf course and park area. Currently, we're having to use fresh water, over a million gallons of fresh water a day um, in those areas when we definitely should be using reused water uh, on those applications. And you know, looking at partnering with our industries and businesses in the area, um, one of the funny things, I guess, when you, when you talk about energy, and this is an energy sector, a lot of people don't necessarily look at the Panhandle of Oklahoma as an energy sector. Uh, we do have gas and oil, and we're very proud of the gas and oil we do have there. But when you think of energy, and you think of Texas County as the number one ag producing county in the state of Oklahoma. And all three counties are in the top five ag producing counties in the state. And Texas County is usually in the top 20 in the country on an annual basis. Uh, those three counties usually have a 5 billion gross production number on an annual basis. So um, $5 billion is no uh, small change. So we do produce energy for food <laughs> that supplies energy for our bodies. So I guess that's one sector. But we're also looking at alternative energy and renewable energies uh, that'll go hand in hand with that. We were working really close with um, some of our industries there. Um, one of those is the uh, High Plains Bioenergy Plant that's a wholly owned subsidiary of Seaboard Seaboard Foods for process processing plant there in Guyman. They process about 23,000 hogs a day. They have a lot of affluent that comes off of that and um, with that affluent, they've been capturing that with, with the uh, lagoons, putting the tarp over it, and reusing their methane within the facility. So they've already 
started that energy process there. Then they utilize all their fats uh, from their process as well as regional processes uh, that come in there to make 36 million gallons of biodiesel annually. We're working with them to partner with them in the city to separate the solids from the water, uh, take the water through the reuse system that we're looking at doing, and taking the solids into a biogas system to either make electricity or put a biodigester on and, and uh, make into uh, CNG. The uh, seaboard plant themselves have already purchased 150 Kenworth semi trucks that are straight CNG and have already put in, uh, they just opened a new CNG filling station there in Guyman for them and, and the public. So um, the other factor that we're really doing is embracing uh, wind energy. This is a, it's fairly new to the panhandle, but it seems like it should make sense. We have wide open spaces, less, less park populated, and we have some of the best class four winds in the country, uh, as well as solar. So we are looking into those. Uh, we've been working with Clean Line Energy out of Houston. It's getting ready to, they've been working for six years and hopefully we'll complete the DOE process this next year to put in a 3,500 megawatt uh, HVDC line that'll start south of Guyman and take clean energy uh, to the East Coast grid system. So we're pretty excited about that. And the study that was done by the Wind Coalition, the third party study this last year also showed that uh, wind energy has saved about 2.3 billion gallons of water annually with the production of, of energy coming from wind since wind uh, does not use water for the process. And it also helps extend the life of our natural resource that we have an abundance of uh, <clears throat> with natural gas. The other factor is a lot of our farmers and ranchers through these drought cycles that we've had over the years uh, need a way to diversify. And wind energy, solar, those kind of components have really started to help our farmers and ranchers hold on to their family farms. So we're excited about those opportunities. I'm going to let Dwayne uh, take it from here and talk about the technical data. Thanks, Vicki. I, I, really, the, the impetus behind the Panhandle water plant from Vicki and Russell was to change the dialogue, change the conversation from the panhandle is devastated by drought. The ag community, the community <laughs> irrigators are going unregulated using water, depleting the Ogallala aquifer, just making money for today. And for the future, it's going to ruin the environment and the ag production in the Panhandle. And Vicki is an economic development specialist. We talked about some of the economic development. How do you recruit business into that environment? Right? It's an ag-based economy. And if ag is, if the, if the storyline is that ag is the problem, and you've got an ag-based economy, see some of the issues that come up. It was also discussion downstate. I really learned what a downstate is. I'm, I'm one of them. I, I live in Oklahoma City. Russell. And Vicki tried. You know, you don't go to the Panhandle and live there by accident. <laughs> Whatever reason it is, you want to be there. Don't understand that fully, but you want to be there. So the downstaters are saying, you know, we need in-stream flows. We need conjunctive use management. You know, gosh, we ought to have metering on water wells. And the Panhandle folks are <clears throat> largely independent. I'm being that's, nice that's here. That's why right? I live there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and really want to be, for the most part, left alone. And so when they saw this, they, a lot of it, lack of understanding on their part, I believe. But what they feared was this discussion was going to happen downstate about putting regulations in the panhandle that people didn't understand what agriculture was about and what they would do. And if you ever have gone to the panhandle and looked at agriculture, it's, 
it's a, you know, I, I kind of thought I grew up in a rural area, uh, thought I knew a little bit about agriculture, and the way they farm in the pandemic isn't anything like anything that I ever grew up with. So, you know, the soil sensors and the marks you talked about, you know, different technologies and so forth. I think what we're going to see and what we learned up there is that they're really advanced. Nobody cares about more efficient water use than the agriculture community does. It's their livelihood. So when I go through this, I want to tell you what their story is from this panhandle report. Okay. Okay. In the Panhandle, there's really groundwater. It's the Ogallala surface water. We have a lake that's full of air. <laughs> and the historic water use in Texas County, uh, you can see, is over 300,000 acre feet per year. Uh, and I'm going to show a map here of some groundwater level declines uh, in the Panhandle. And you'll see that Texas County is really the bullseye in Oklahoma for water use in the Oklahoma Valley. So we look here in Texas County in the middle, Kansas to the north, Texas to the south, and that north central part of Texas County is, is really the, the heart of the Ogallala in Oklahoma. And one thing that we looked at was the regulations in Kansas. Margaret Fast with the Kansas Water Office. Uh, uh, in Kansas, the groundwater is public water. In Oklahoma and Texas, it's private water. Different laws, different regulations. Metering in Kansas, metering in Texas, no metering in Oklahoma. And the groundwater declines are all about the same. So you can't go to Kansas and say, your law worked better because you had more water, or to Texas. All three are different, and all the declines are about the same. And since the beginning of irrigation time, the water levels have gone down about 100 feet. There's some big time decline. So if you want to tell the story of how bad the irrigators are, and, and what devastations happened to the panhandle because of agriculture, hundreds, and decline, that's how you begin the story. You can see over in Beaver County, we've actually had some increases in water up to 10 feet, I think, increases in that. So what the Panhandle people basically, one of their basic premises was they wanted to protect the private property right aspect of the groundwater. And they didn't want to extend the life of the overall aquifer on the back of some new regulatory program. The demands, the green is <coughs> ag, irrigated agriculture. Uh, and, and so that's the big elephant in the closet. And if you're going to uh, extend the life of the aquifer in the panhandle, you're going to deal with that. You know, what happens in a drought, Mark, in the Panhandle? You know, when, you, when you're getting two, 10 or 15 inches of rain a year, you're always in a drought. <laughs> they mitigate it by pumping ground. I'm trying to pump this thing. On the right side there. All right. I'm going to skip over the population growth where I've got down to two minutes because I'm going to make my phone sit there. All right, so in summary, limited surface water, groundwater recharge slow, uh, and as we get to this, these next two slides are really where we, we tell the storylines that came in. When you look at water use in million gallons a day back in 1994, 625 million <clears throat> gallons a day. In 2005, it was 244 million gallons a day. So we reduced water use in the panhandle by up to 60%. And when you then look at the number of irrigated acres in, in that beginning 230,000 to 232,000. So we've reduced, we've become more efficient, 
we've used less water while we've kept irrigated acreage about the same. And just as important, the next slide, the green is a $2.93 billion uh, uh, into the ag agriculture product sold to 3.24 billion. So we can decrease usage, we can conserve water, we can be more efficient with our water, and we can also increase our economic benefit with that. And this story being told then is not that we're devastated, it's that we're finding ways to implement efficiencies using water so that we can decrease our water use, we can extend the life of the Ogallala, and we can increase our economic production. And one of the, I think, the major pieces that's come from this, J.D., when the Water Board has its goal and the governor's goal of water for 2060, not using any more water in 2060 than we're using today, that, at least from my perspective, has become a celebration of water conservation in Oklahoma. And as, as they go to the Panhandle and tour and learn about that, and those stories start coming out about the Panhandle, that's exactly the impact that the irrigators and the economic development people wanted to have happen when they developed this plan. <clears throat> so I'll turn it over now to Russell, and he's going to talk to you about the farm. Hello. I'm a farmer, not a talker, so this thing is really fast. You don't need the, you don't need the cute cars for me. <laughs> you just sit back and relax. So. I'm, I'm, I'm also a friend of you should never skip out on your, uh, on your duties. I skip one board meeting and I become president. And here I am. So anyhow, here we go. How do I make this go? Push that right in the air. Okay. Okay. Um, when we decided to, to, to become a part of this plan and to, and to do this, the first thing we had to determine is a benchmark. What are we doing? Or a baseline, I guess. What are we doing? How are we doing? We, we really, we knew we were being conservation-minded, but we didn't know how well we were doing. So here's some of that data. We, we have to decide, are we doing a good job? Well. 30 years ago, we ran water down ditches and it evaporated a lot of it. And it was a very inefficient way of irrigating. We've, we've stepped up to sprinkler irrigation now, and, and you can see that in our in our panhandle, we're 85, or no, that's just the efficiencies, but you can see by the by the uh, blue how, how, how we are on, on irrigation. It's almost all uh, pivot irrigation. We're starting to get drip irrigation also, but you can see how little bit of that, but it is, it only gains small efficiencies. Sprinkler irrigation, we're showing 85% efficiency, drip at 89%, so that's a, for the cost involved, the next slide I think you'll see that it's a very small gain, but it is, it is gaining a foothold and there is, there is uh, research being done on that. So, and, and here's a slide that shows that it's not, it's not beneficial to our, con to our economy, to switch the whole panhandle to, to drip irrigation just to save that last little bit. It's not it's not going to be an economic benefit. However, as I said, it is taking a foothold and it's it's becoming a it's becoming a way of doing it. Um, so so there is a lot there is quite a bit of drip irrigation beginning to, to get done. Um, this is just self explanatory our, our crops, uh, corn is still still are uh, Corn and wheat are very close to the rest of the crops. And, uh, but um, as, a far as farmers, we, we understand the, the benefit of, or the necessity to conserve our, our water. It's, it's our most valuable resource. If, if, if we don't have the water, we, we almost cease to exist in, in our area. We live, we live in an arid climate. We, it's, it's harsh. I mean, we have fields that, that haven't raised a crop in three or four years because they don't have irrigation. Um, so that's kind of where we're going, uh, what we have to protect. So what we found whenever we did do the, the, the study 
for the regional water plan was that, that we are doing a good job. As, a, as an industry agriculture, we do a good job out of necessity. We will continue to do a good job and, and we're, we are working forward to do to, to keep improving even though even though the improve we've had huge improvements in the in the past, the improvements are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller just because there's not that much more to improve. But but uh, at the same time, we we have the, our regional plan shows that we do do a good job with that. Um, so um, there's other ways to conserve water other than just the way we apply irrigation. There's different crops help us conserve water. We have we have a genetically modified or genetically enhanced, whatever you want to call it. We have crops that use less water than they than what a, a, a normal crop would. So so that's that's a way that we're saving water is in the crops that we raise. Um, another way is in our tillage options. We you know you till the ground completely open, you, you waste a lot of water, so we don't do that anymore. Most of it's all no till, you just plant right into the residue that can also conserve water. So that that's all these little things added up to our 60% decline in, in usage of water. I mean, that's that's how we got that, to that point. So, um, uh, I'm trying to cover this. We've, we've taken steps and we're going to continue to take steps. And, and uh, so, so that's. Uh, I think the I think the the water plan the, the regional water plan that we came up with shows it shows that we're doing a good job, but it also it, it gives us a a, a, a way of I say sorry, but we we have determined that we can continue to get better, and, and it lays the groundwork to to have more research done. I think that's that's the point we're at now is helping to get. I mean, water resources board helps us that helps out. With, with funding, I mean uh, the USDA, uh, NRCS. There's there's funding to do research on better ways to, to conserve water, and better ways to irrigate, better ways to farm, and, and so that's kind of where we're at in our plan now. Is we feel there's money is better spent on research than regulation because uh, research is going to give us the answer. Regulation just just ties it ties it. With that, I guess I'm kind of done. I told you you wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs>